libertarians take a, a dark view at anti-discrimination laws and public accommodation laws that say, if you open your business to the public, you've got to serve everybody. Does this case fundamentally challenge or engage that kind of issue? Well, it brushes past it. And I'll say by way of uh, background that exactly half the states currently have public accommodation laws in which sexual orientation or gender identity mm -hmm. are one of the protected categories. So by that definition, half of America was already a hellscape. I mm -hmm. uh, will go along with your term uh, mm -hmm. for gay people or else, or else you may not notice it because in fact, in those yeah. other 25 states, it's very hard to find any actual instances <laughs> in which mm -hmm. other than with wedding services and a couple of very narrowly defined controversies, very difficult to find any difference in, in treatment. Um, Libertarians, um, uh, you're right, you're absolutely right, uh, have a, uh, uh, I think, justified suspicion of the attempt to use public accommodation laws to um, uh, override the uh, independent judgment of businesses of how to serve. And uh, I say brushed against it because both the majority and the minority in the 303 creative case uh, did turn to history. Um, there were questions uh, it, um, which may shed light on whether public accommodation laws were a fairly rare and exceptional thing or were something that were completely accepted even in the grand old libertarian classical liberal period. Uh, it was certainly accepted that some businesses like uh, inns to stay the night in a country mm -hmm. where you might freeze to death if they wouldn't take you in were under a public accommodation obligation. We, we do know that about mm -hmm. Anglo-American history um, and some others um, uh, closely related in the hospitality business. Uh, what about someone who uh, it would fix your shoes? What about someone who uh, would bake you a cake? Well, the majority brushes by a theory that um, uh, if you look at old instances where classical liberal societies accepted the public accommodation um, idea, the idea that businesses un undertook a particular accommodation, that it, uh, aside from the hospitality on the road cases, they were very often monopoly cases. If you're going to give a company a monopoly over something, you darn well are going to give them an obligation to serve every single customer. Um, and then the dissent by Sotomayor said, oh, no, no, no. By the time she was done talking about it, you would really would think that every single person whoever offered any services or products was under a public accommodations obligation, which I think is not actually true no. if you go back to, to, to the old law books. So, so they both found it worth engaging. And yet on one level, it uh, what they said does not change uh, the sweep of these laws. It mm -hmm. does leave me the opportunity to say as a libertarian that the stakes of social division go down if you don't define every single florist and calligrapher mm -hmm. as a public accommodation. If you take a reasonable view that you know some things are big and public enough, like theaters, that uh, there is some sort of public stigma in not being allowed. Uh, but if you try to extend it to every little uh, one person mm -hmm. business, you are going to have more social division. You just are. Can I ask Wally, as as a gay man who I believe is married, correct? Uh, well, Steve have thinks so. Okay, yeah. Um, um, maybe married in multiple states. I don't know. You know, it's like, uh, uh, but you know, how, when you read about somebody who is like, you know what, like, I'll make you a website, but like, I'll be damned if I'm going to, you know, write, you know, uh, you know, here's our gift registry for a wedding, or I'll, you can buy a cake I baked, but I'll be damned if I'm going to write, you know, best wishes, you know. Except, I mean, like, how, how, you know, how do you respond to that on an individual level? Well, I, there's a great line from uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston up about uh, being discriminated against. I can't imagine, she said, why people would want to deprive themselves of the delight of my company. Now, that is a, <laughs> that is a confident person's uh, response to being discriminated right. against. Obviously, she lived in bad circumstances in the South, and she knew perfectly well that there was more and worse to be had from discrimination. But I love the attitude because especially when the discrimination is just symbolic and is not actually causing you to uh, not be able to get the, the job or the home or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. you just brush it off as people who haven't learned what they need to know about the world. Uh, it's um, 
Uh, and, and here we get to the series of cases involving Masterpiece Cake Shop and mm -hmm. the Flowers case and now the website case, which is, uh, it's very hard to find any of those cases in which uh, gay people getting married uh, or these date back to the point where you couldn't get married and it was just uh, solemnizing a, a, a relationship. Very hard to find any of these instances in which the people didn't have lots of other good choices of people who would gladly have mm -hmm. served their business. and. Uh, so again, it gets me thinking about Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, are you just trying to sue yeah. in order to make a point? Yeah, uh, Zora Neale Hurston is uh, somebody who we can all do, we can all benefit from, uh, you know, thinking about a lot more and looking at her life, uh, certainly her literary output. But, but there's a real sense of tragedy there. And Coleman, I know that you're familiar with Zora Neale Hurston, who, mm -hmm. you know, was a uh, also a uh, Columbia student uh, back in the day and studied with Franz Boas in the anthropology department and suffered real massive indignities. Is that, uh, you know, uh, on the account of both her gender and her race, but I mean, is it that we are in a stage now and it's always, you know, uh, it, you know, we're always declaring victory way too soon in all kinds of wars, right? But like, is it the world that she lived in and that level of anger and hate and contempt for sexual minorities, for racial minorities, for ethnic minorities, is that mostly behind us? And is that something that we need to incorporate into our contemporary discussions of things? It's interesting. I'm of two minds on this. On the one hand, I think we have made massive progress in uh, people's attitudes, uh, towards minorities, uh, racial minorities, sexual minorities, etc. On the other hand, I don't think that these bigotries will ever be gone fully mm -hmm. and permanently. I think um, I, I, I think human nature has a, a bigoted element to it that is reducible, but not eradicable. Mm -hmm. And and uh, at some level, we're, we're going to be living with some amount of racism, some amount of homophobia, until the end of time. And we should, while combating it, we should understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Wally, uh, can I ask from, uh, you know, and again, this is going back into the, uh, you know, kind of libertarian subculture, people like Milton Friedman talked about this, as well as a wide variety of other people whose motivations may not have been as clear or as pure, I think, as Friedman's. But um, you know, there is an argument, and I guess Gary Becker also made this another Nobel Prize winning economist saying, you know, that businesses that discriminate in a stupid and foolish way or, in, in a, you know, will actually be punished by markets operating. Um, so, you know, that that 303 creative, you know, probably uh, isn't that good a website anyway or, or will lose enough business, uh, you know, that uh, companies that refuse to hire women or blacks or, you know, Latinos who were good workers, um, you know, end up paying more higher wages for shittier workers and things like that. Is it is it more than theoretical to say that, you know, markets, re relatively free markets actually punish discriminatory behavior? It's a big topic, Nick, and mm -hmm. I can offer particular examples that back up uh, Milton Friedman's suggestions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well known, I think, that in the South during Jim Crow, uh, railroads and others who needed a lot of skilled labor uh, were uh, constantly seeing if they could undermine uh, Jim Crow because it was denying them access to a lot mm -hmm. of workers who would have done very well. And the um, it gets complicated because, uh, as Coleman said, sometimes you've got a background of uh, rural uh, social prejudice in uh, that has not been eradicated and markets can sometimes transmit that in that if bigoted right. customers won't visit your restaurant or whatever. Um, so I don't want to make sweeping assertions. Mm -hmm. I think that um, courts by and large uh, dis decide and should decide the cases on other bases. Where these things come in again is every one of those state and local anti-discrimination in public accommodations laws was passed uh, through a legislative process in which people could weigh some of these things. And I mm -hmm. urge people, again, as someone who, not, not just from my libertarian standpoint, but as someone who doesn't want to see social divisiveness, um, you know, 
that's the time to go in and say, uh, are you legislating just to demonstrate your virtue or is there really mm -hmm. some social uh, problem that is solved by extending it from um, uh, old style public accommodations to every single little one person operation. Uh, but you would agree that public accommodation laws, which do restrict the right of businesses to operate however they see fit, are actually beneficial in certain cases? Or well, I, I, I would say from a libertarian standpoint, um, I'd, I follow, I think this is the Richard Epstein analysis. I'd mm -hmm. like to uh, uh, confine them to the cases where there is a practical monopoly. Uh, ironically, uh, inns to stay for the night, which were effectively uh, a, a practical, if not a, a royally granted monopoly mm -hmm. um, centuries ago, it, you know, with Airbnb, uh, it, it, you know, not, not at all. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't mind for utilities and I can see at least their point uh, uh, if someone is going to freeze to death of saying mm -hmm. uh, the inn is um, uh, freighted with a special public interest, um, but I would make it as um, I would make it a demanding test that wouldn't result in very many public accommodations laws. That was an excerpt from our recent live stream with Walter Olson of the Cato Institute and Coleman Hughes talking about recent court decisions dealing with affirmative action and whether or not website operators had to serve gay couples. If you want to see another excerpt, go here. If you want to see the full thing, and you should, go here.